Just before we come to hear uh, the Bible reading from Ephesians chapter 6, uh, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather as your people to hear your word. Please strengthen us by the same spirit that inspired your word to understand it and to apply it to our daily lives for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our third Bible reading comes from Ephesians chapter 6 and starting at verse 10. And it's on page uh, 1039, I think, of your pew Bibles. This is the Apostle Paul writing. He says, Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armour of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armour of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand, therefore, with the truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armour on your chest, and your feet sandaled with the readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. Well, it is a great passage and it's a privilege to be with you here in Narrabri to talk about this passage with you today. We're thinking then about the spiritual battle that we're engaged in uh, as Christians. Uh, Recently I was encouraged uh, by a a long-standing friend to read a book called uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, It's by John Bunyan. Has anyone read that book? A few of you have. That's great. Well, Bunyan was no stranger to trials. Uh, He was a tinker by trade and became a Baptist preacher in England uh, in the mid-1600s. He was imprisoned in 1661 for preaching without a licence. Lay preachers, if you got your licence. <laughs> but um, he languished actually in a Bedford jail in primitive conditions for 12 years for that offence. It was there that he penned the original draft of Pilgrim's Progress and the Bible was really his only reference material. Now last a uh, couple of weeks ago I purchased the new edition and It's beautiful pictures in it as well. I've thoroughly enjoyed reading it. But, you know, the thing that has struck me most is how realistic Bunyan is about the spiritual oppositions we'll all face as Christians. He talks often about the devil and his agents and how he strives to drag us down as Christians. Now, interestingly, the Apostle Paul also talks often about spiritual opposition Uh, that we're going to face as Christians. And today we're looking at the last part of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Having spelled out the incredible blessings and purpose of the Christian life in chapters 1 to 3 and then given them some practical instructions in chapters 4 to 6, Paul now finishes his letter with a timely reminder to the Christians at Ephesus. And that is that they have a committed spiritual opponent when it comes to living out the Christian life. His name is the devil, Uh, he plays dirty, and he'll do anything to win. And they need to be ready to do battle with him. And so today we're going to consider two things. Uh, Firstly, our opponent, the devil, and secondly, how to fight him. Well, let's start with our opponent, the devil. C.S. Lewis, in his preface to that excellent book, Screwtape Letters, says this. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. 
The other is to believe and to feel an excessive interest, an unhealthy interest in them. Now, I don't know, but my hunch is that we tend to fall into the first error. We live in a materialistic society that tells us what you see is all there is. And because we can't see the devil and his helpers, we tend to think he's not active. But the reality is that the devil is alive and well and is very much at work in our world. Uh, Yes, he's a defeated enemy because of what Jesus has done through his death and resurrection, but he has not conceded defeat. The devil is a little bit like a, a savage dog on an unbreakable chain. He's restrained by God, but still doing his best to turn people away from God, uh, still seeking to bring down and destroy God's people. Well, if you're going to successfully battle an opponent, you need to know what they're like, don't you? So what does this passage from Ephesians 6 tell us about him? Look with me at verse 11. Paul says, Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So first thing to note is that the devil is a schemer and we're called as Christians to take our stand against his schemes. Now think about this. Schemers are rarely honest or straightforward. Uh, They manipulate people and circumstances to achieve their own ends. They tend to attack from behind They use lies and deception to get what they want. And the Bible tells us that the devil is just like that. He schemes to drag Christians down and to keep non-Christians from seeing the truth. And so he's described by Jesus as a liar and the father of lies. The devil will tempt us to fall into sin, just as he did with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He'll tempt us when we're at our most vulnerable And he knows the tune to whistle for each one of us. You know what the tune is for you, don't you? What temptation tune does the devil whistle to you, say when you're tired or when you're hungry or when you're feeling down? Perhaps it's the uh, temptation to gossip or the temptation to drink too much. Or maybe it's the temptation to love money or the temptation to indulge in sexual sin or the temptation to become jealous or unforgiving. Friends, the devil is a schemer and he'll use things that are not even bad in themselves to draw us into sin. Uh, Maybe a, a juicy piece of news or a cool drink on a hot day or an attractive person that we look at too often. Friends, we need to be on our guard against the devil's schemes and work out strategies to block our ears to his seductive tunes. The Apostle Peter warns us to be sober and to be watchful, for our enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Uh, John Stott, in his good commentary on Ephesians, says of the devil, he is a dangerous wolf, but enters Christ's flock in the disguise of a sheep. Sometimes he roars like a lion, but more often is as subtle as a serpent. We should be aware that he's at work, uh, plotting to bring us down, prodding to blind us in sin, uh, bind us in sin and and guilt so that we become ineffective in our Christian life and witness. So that's our opponent, the devil. Uh, Question is, how do we fight him? Well, look with me as we read on in Ephesians uh, 6 verses 10 and 11. Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Notice here we are to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Strong not in ourselves. Actually, we're weak in ourselves. Most of our failures and defeats are due to our own foolish self-confidence where we either disbelieve or forget how formidable our spiritual enemies are. So we are to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power by putting on the armour he has provided. Well, what is that armour? Now, verses 14 to 17 lay out the full armour of God and there's six pieces described here and we're going to look very briefly at each one. Okay, Verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. The belt of truth is the truth made known to us in the scriptures. 
uh, the truth that's made known to us in the scriptures of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is an essential piece of equipment in opposing the devil whose chief tactic is to lie and to deceive. You know, as Christians, we live in a world that's increasingly confused about what is truth. Uh, God's objective standard of truth has largely been rejected and replaced by a subjective standard of truth that's determined internally by what the individual thinks and feels. So if it's right for me, if it feels right for me, then it is right for me. That's how most people think. Uh, Being truthful is now seen as being truthful to yourself rather than stating anything that is objectively true according to history or according to God's word or even according to the evidence at hand. Now, in such a fluid climate, we'll need courage and wisdom to speak the truth according to God's word, the Bible. We mustn't be timid in standing for God's truth because eternal salvation is at stake. Increasingly, as Christians, we'll need to be prepared to take flack as we speak the truth in love, but it is vital that we do because Satan's main weapon is rendered ineffective when we hold fast to the truth of God's word and stand against his lies. Well, the second piece of armour, verse 14, is the breastplate of righteousness. Generally, in Paul's writings, righteousness refers to the righteousness of Christ that becomes ours through faith. Uh, For example, in Romans 3, Paul says, But now a righteousness from God apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. You know, the devil will frequently accuse us before God and plague us with our unworthiness when we fail. But, you know, when God looks upon a person who's put their trust in the Lord Jesus, he sees only Christ's righteousness. Our sins were paid for in full by Jesus on the cross and so through faith in him we stand before God clothed with the full righteousness of Jesus. Now friends, this is the reality according to God's word. Putting on the breastplate of righteousness is about taking hold of that reality and clinging to it. Now I don't know about you, but Satan often accuses me before God and plagues me with my own unworthiness when I fail. Uh, Pride or or lust or anger or just plain selfishness all manifest themselves in sinful behaviour in me from time to time. And when that happens, I feel woeful about my sin. And when I fail, my tendency, my natural tendency, is to hammer myself. It's at those times I need to remind myself that I am actually counted righteous not because of my own performance but because of my faith in the Lord Jesus. By faith, his righteousness has become my righteousness before God and even when I don't feel it, I know that this is true according to the promises of God's word. Now, reminding ourselves of that truth and clinging to it is what I think putting on the breastplate of righteousness is all about. Do you know um, that great hymn, Before the Throne of God Above? Does anyone know this hymn? Yeah. It, it, that, that particular hymn has been a big help to me in this. The third verse of that hymn says this, When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, up would I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. That is such good news, don't you think? It's such a relief. Friends, the breastplate of righteousness is solid armour in a war where the devil's tactic is so often to tempt us to despair and make us ineffective through shame and false guilt. Well, verse 15 brings us to the next piece of armour. Look at it with me. It goes on, With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now, sometimes uh, the best way to defend is to attack. 
So often when churches experience discouragement, whether it be through opposition from the world or conflict with relationships within or even the challenge of a pandemic, they pull their gospel boots off and they go into survival mode. Friends, as we move into the year uh, that's left to us, we need to remember that we have been entrusted with the life-transforming gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the good news that brings peace between God and mankind, the only news that will do that. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Uh, Jesus' final instructions to his followers, you remember, were go and make disciples of all nations. So we have a job to do as Christians as we look forward to Christ's return. Our diocesan uh, mission statement sums it up well when it says we are on about introducing all people to Jesus and helping them home to heaven. Now, you've heard that lots of times before. Uh, I know you're already on about that here in the Narrabri Parish, but can I just encourage you today to keep your gospel boots on because it's only through hearing the gospel, the good news about Jesus, that people will come into God's kingdom. Uh, That is why I'm commending this book to you to help you keep your gospel boots on, to help help you keep talking to people about Jesus, that they too might find salvation. We fire serious artillery at the devil when we tell other people the good news about Jesus. It's like liberating captives from the oppressor. The devil hates it, but God loves it, and we need to stick at it. Well, we're collecting some useful armour, aren't we? But that's not all. Look with me, verse 15. He says, In addition to to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, the background to this is the large Roman shields of the day which were covered with leather and soaked with water and used for protection against flame-tipped arrows. The devil's flame-tipped arrows include his frequent accusations, which inflame our conscience with false guilt, as I've spoken about, even though we've been forgiven. Other darts might include thoughts of doubt or lust or hatred or fear. I don't know about you, but periodically I go through intense struggles with unwanted evil thoughts. I won't tell you what they are. You probably have your own. But those flaming arrows often strike me when I'm tired or or discouraged. The good news is that God has given us a piece of armour that will help us put them out if we use it. So the shield of faith takes hold of the promises of God in times of doubt or depression. Faith takes hold of the power of God that is ours in the gospel in times of temptation. By faith in the Lord Jesus We are freed from slavery to sin and death. Indeed, we have God's power by his spirit to say no to sin. We need to get good at using the shield of faith because those arrows are just going to keep coming until we die and go to glory. Well, the next piece of armour is the helmet of salvation. Paul says, take the helmet of salvation. You know, assurance of salvation is the ultimate defence against an enemy who seeks to destroy our souls. Though the devil hates us, he can never separate us from the wonderful love of God. In Romans 8, Paul says this, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, how good is that? That is the helmet of salvation. That assurance should help us live lives that are motivated by love rather than fear because our future is secure in Jesus regardless of what happens to us in this world. So Christians who wear the helmet of salvation are very robust people indeed because it's hard to shake a person who's not afraid of death, isn't it? Yet that is our position if we wear this piece of armour through trust in Jesus. The helmet of salvation, I think, 
for me, has been of particular comfort uh, since taking on the bishop's job just over a year ago. Uh, you know, for the first time in my life, I've encountered enemies who are proactively seeking to take me down. I've never had enemies. All of a sudden, I, I just go, whoa, I can't believe the strength of opposition. They are people blinded by Satan to the plain truth of God's word. They're sincere, but deceived. They're misguided, but they're determined. Indeed, in a few weeks, the Dean of the Armidale Cathedral and I will face the secular legal system. We'll be brought before a tribunal by those who oppose us. And we'll be forced to defend our right as ministers to have pastoral conversation with congregation members engaged in willful sin according to God's word. This, this is the climate we're in. It's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder for us as Christians. Do you know, sometimes I, I wake up in the night dreaming, <laughs> rehearsing what I might say at that tribunal. In the wee hours of the night, when, I, when everything seems bleak, as time, I lie awake wondering what might happen if against all odds they rule against us and put all evangelical pastors in the firing line going forward. Now, it's at times like those I need to remember that regardless of what happens, God is still sovereign, Jesus is still king, and heaven is 100% secure in Jesus. 100%. That's the helmet of salvation. Putting it on helps me to live out of love, not out of fear. It gives me confidence. It gives me hope to persevere. Well, the last piece of armour mentioned, uh, verse 17, is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus knew how to use this one well, didn't he? Remember, we heard in our first reading, didn't we, when he faced the devil in the wilderness, uh, each time the devil tempted him, he replied, it is written, quoted scripture, it is written, quoted scripture, it is written, quoted the word of God. In the end, the devil gave up and left him alone. See, Jesus knew the scriptures, didn't he? He was a master with the sword of the Spirit. And I think the challenge to us is quite clear. We, too, have been given the sword of the Spirit to counter the devil's attacks when they come. But to use it, of course, we need to know and understand the Bible, don't we? And to know and understand it, we need to read it regularly, together and on our own. So getting to church regularly to hear the scriptures read and explained will be vital. Uh, if you're not in a Bible study group during the week with others, let me suggest you get into one because that is also really good to help you grow in your understanding of God's word. Having a quiet time on your own each day, reading God's word and praying about what you're reading will help you too. Friends, whatever you do, get stuck into God's word, won't you? The Holy Spirit literally transforms us as we read and understand and then prayerfully apply the Bible to our lives. And this is true. As a minister over the years, I've watched this transformation happen time and time again with people, and it is brilliant to see. So I'm saying, saying take hold of the sword of the Spirit by reading, studying and applying the Bible. It is a very effective weapon that will help us stand our ground in this day-to-day -day battle against the devil. Well, that's the armour of God that he's given us. There it is there. Uh, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Every piece, in a way, comes to us as a result of the gospel. God has given it to us to enable us to fight the devil, and we need to take God at his word and use this armour in his strength. Which brings us finally then to the importance of prayer. Look with me at verse 18. Paul goes on, Pray in the spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. If we trust in Jesus as our Saviour and live with him as our Lord, we are the saints. <laughs> if we're to put on the gospel armour in order to stand firm against the evil one, we will need each other's prayers. The good news is that the Holy Spirit will help us to pray, 
But we must also be mindful and alert and stick at praying for one another. Now, I don't know how you pray for your Christian brothers and sisters, whether you're organised in that. I've found a prayer diary can be helpful. Uh, now, I trust you would have recently received the, the new diocesan prayer, uh, prayer diary. I brought a few extra copies if you don't have one. But I hope that this will help you to be faithful in prayer for the saints all over our diocese and particularly for their leaders. The Apostle Paul knew that he needed the prayers of God's people to persevere in his work. Uh, In verses 19 and 20 he says, Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, word may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Friends, I would love you to be praying that for me as well. (laughs) that whenever I open my mouth, word may be given to me that I might fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, that I might declare it fearlessly as I should. And I know for a fact that church leaders right across our diocese would appreciate the same. So can I encourage you with me to use the diocesan prayer diary this year? If we set aside a little time each day uh, it will help us keep on praying for all the saints, that together we might remain strong in the Lord and stand our ground against the devil and his schemes. Let me pray for us as we finish. Dear Lord God, we thank you for your love made known to us in the gospel of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you that in the gospel you have given us all that we need to stand firm against the devil and his schemes. Please strengthen us by your spirit to put on the gospel armour you have given us and to use it well. Please keep us firm in our faith and faithful in our prayers that together we might bring glory to you and growth to your kingdom. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.